Hey everybody and welcome to uh, the last iteration of our video lecture series for exam 3. Um, today we're going to be discussing bone and looking at it in a holistic sense, thinking first about what the functions of bone are, moving in uh, into some of the structure and how that relates to those functions, and then finally uh, we're going to be looking at the dynamics of bone, how bone changes and in response to what. So uh, just jumping ahead, you can probably imagine bone changes in response to uh, being broken. Um, but bone is also under the influence of hormones, um, and bone can act as a reservoir uh, for, for vital substances. So we'll get into more about what I mean by a reservoir um, in a few minutes. But first, let's just start off with the basic functions, the, the ones that you probably are very familiar with, protection, movement, and support. So bone offers vital protection uh, to vital organs. Your brain is surrounded by the skull. Um, you know, you can uh, replace a lot of structures in your body, but you cannot replace uh, the nervous tissue in your brain. So it's important that it's well protected and bone serves to protect a lot of vital organs. Um, movement. You might think of movement as being primarily a function of the musculature, however, Without bone, muscles uh, and, and the rest of the, the structure of your body, would you'd be more or less a quivering mass. The, the bones would have nothing to push and pull against. Um, so, so bone provides a scaffold for muscle to attach to. And muscle can pull and push bones and allow you to move throughout the world. So um, movement is, is another critical function of bone. Uh, so without either muscle or bone, movement would be impossible. And then uh, support. Bone is able to support the structure of your body. So much like uh, you know, you think about uh, the structure of the cell being supported by the cytoskeleton and uh, the phospholipid bilayers, um, those, those are going to, to keep a cell in a certain shape. And, um, and that's despite lots and lots of forces that are pushing and pulling on the cell at any given time. So like a cell has stretching and uh, pressure being applied to it all the time, your body has forces being applied to it all the time. And we need to resist those forces to keep us from being pulled into that lump of goo that we would be without bone. So. Um, the, the main force that you probably think about uh, the most that's at all, constantly acting on your body is gravity. And without bone, uh, gravity would overcome our bodies and pull us into that lump of goo on the ground. So your, your bones are going to support the overall structure of your body, even in the face of um, lots of pressures uh, and, and different forces that act on your body uh, throughout the day. Um, so, some of the, the lesser known functions of bone, um, we'll start off with uh, one, one that's really important in, uh, you know, most functions of any organ in the body are going to be related to maintenance of homeostasis. Um, so how, how protection and movement and support relates to homeostasis is a little more indirect. Um, but there are direct links to homeostasis with bone as well. So the, the first link is um, in mineral homeostasis. Your body uh, and, and um, organs around your body have the need for certain minerals, calcium and phosphate and electrolytes. So um, cells around your body need things like calcium and phosphate. Uh, and much like cells around your body need glucose. So you, you have storage of molecules that we use for energy. So it also makes sense that we have storage for other molecules that are useful to cells like calcium and phosphate. And these minerals are stored in the bone. So they're going to, to play a critical role in the structure of bone. Calcium uh, and these mineral salts provide bone its hardness. Uh, but calcium has other uses, uh, for example, in muscle contraction. So muscle cells 
need calcium. And if our diet is low in calcium, we have this storage center, the bones, where uh, we can release calcium in the case that uh, we're, we're low on certain minerals. So bone acts as a storage reservoir for minerals. Um, and, and some of the substances that are stored in bone are also crucial in, in helping us to regulate homeostasis of acids versus bases. So keeping uh, our, our bodies and the fluid in our bodies at a constant pH is another role um, that the bone plays. Um, blood cells, you, you probably have heard of bone marrow, um, but the bone marrow is, this, is the place where blood cells are being formed. And uh, bone marrow can be found inside the bone. So um, storage of the material uh, and, and the cells that participate in forming new blood cells are also housed in the bone. So, so formation of new blood cells is, is a very important function of bone as well. And then finally, um, red marrow is the site of blood cell formation, and yellow marrow is the site of fat storage in bone. So, um, along with adipocytes that you find, uh, you know, around your belly, your hips, buttocks, you know, the places that you think of fat building up, um, bones are actually a site where fat can be stored as well. And um, that fat serves as a, a cushion. It's going to um, be involved in the structure of the bone, uh, but also it's uh, a, a site where energy storage um, is, is going to take place. So uh, fat storage in the bone is uh, going to be useful in the case that you're low on energy, um, just like fat storage anywhere else in the body. So that, that would be the last function, primary function of bone. So since you all have uh, already covered this um, to a great extent in lab, I'm not going to uh, spend a lot of time um, looking at the specific structure of things like long bone or the microscopic structure uh, of spongy versus compact bone. But those, those are concepts that um, will be required uh, knowledge for the exam. So I would encourage you to revisit um, the different structures that you'll see, uh, particularly comparing and contrasting compact bone, uh, which of course contains the osteons, versus spongy bone, which is, uh, you know, going to be made up of those trabeculae. Um, so knowing the cells that are present um, and the different structures that are present in these two types of bone um, are going to be important knowledge. Um, and knowing what the different components, what makes an osteon, uh, is also uh, going to be required on the exam. But uh, that's already been covered in lab, so I won't spend time going over that again here. Also, um, the different shapes of bone, long versus short, flat, sesamoid, irregular, um, those different shapes uh, will be something that you'll also want to um, go over before the exam. Uh, but since those were covered pretty uh, deeply in lab already, um, we won't spend lecture time talking about those. But I do want to, again, reiterate that um, there's a, a major difference in um, both the structure and the function of compact versus spongy bone. Compact um, kind of providing the hardness um, and spongy providing a site for bone marrow to re uh, reside. So um, I would also uh, specifically revisit the structure of the long bone. So um, we went into, uh, into pretty great detail in lab what the different structures that you'll find in the long bone. Um, remember the diaphysis, um, epiphyses, um, the growth plate, uh, aka the epiph epiphyseal line. 
Um, so those, those are going to be, again, um, things that we went over in lab, but things that could also potentially be on this exam. So uh, definitely uh, take some time drawing these structures out um, and thinking about um, what the different components of the long bone, the osteon uh, of compact bone, and spongy bone are. Um, and then just revisiting probably something you've already uh, discussed in lab as well, the extracellular matrix of bone is, is going to be really important um, in determining the function of bone. So like any connective tissue, the extracellular matrix um, determines its function. So what is the extracellular matrix again? So the EC part of that, extracellular, means it's what's outside of the cells in that tissue. So in bone, you have certain populations of cells, and they're going to secrete extracellular matrix, so maybe some collagen fibers. Um, they're going to secrete the ground substance, um, which would be your mineral salts like calcium and your phosphate. So uh, those, those are the two components of the extracellular matrix in a connective tissue like bone. Um, you have the ground substance and the fibers. So uh, collagen fibers are going to provide tensile strength. Uh, I mentioned in the support part of the function of bone that um, resisting the forces that are put upon your body all day long. That's a major function of bone. And in order to resist those forces, we need a structure that is somewhat flexible, that's not going to break. And so collagen fibers give you that flexibility of bone, uh, also known as tensile strength. You can apply force to different parts of the bone and it's not going to break because those collagen fibers are there. So bone is actually a little bit flexible um, because of those collagen fibers as well. Um, the mineral salts give bone its hardness. So um, uh, an experiment that um, you may or may not have done in lab was removing either the collagen fibers or the mineral salts from bone and seeing how that affects the structure of bone. So uh, we'll just revisit that. Um, when you bake a bone, you are destroying the collagen fibers. So instead of being flexible and bending like uh, a bow um, when you apply pressure to it, if you bake the bone and remove those collagen fibers, it's going to become just hard. It's no longer hard and flexible, resisting tensile strength. It's just hard. It's only got those mineral salts left. So because it lacks that tensile strength, it's going to be brittle if you remove the collagen fibers. Just meaning if you apply pressure now to that bone, it's going to be more likely to break. It's still going to be hard, but it doesn't resist these tensile forces, pushing and pulling on it all day long. So people, uh, as you age, your collagen fibers uh, become less numerous and less strong. So you lose collagen as you age. That's a major feature of aging, not only in your face, uh, which is why I've got some wrinkles, but um, also in your bone. Your bone tends to lose collagen fibers. And so bones become more brittle as you age and people uh, have more easily broken bones because of that. Now, the other side of this experiment was removing the mineral salts. So if you leave bone uh, in acid for long enough, that will remove the mineral salts, the calcium, from bone. And what you're left with is just this scaffold of collagen. So collagen without those mineral salts, without the ground substance, is just going to be a really squishy, bendy, uh, kind of cartilage-like uh, structure. And um, so you can, you can see very clearly there, it's going to be able to resist those tensile forces if you still have the collagen fibers, but it's not going to have the hardness that it had 
previously if you remove those mineral salts. So of course being that bone is a living tissue, um, in addition to the ground substance and the fibers, there are also cells that are responsible for uh, either building new bone or breaking down bone and recycling the materials uh, that bone is made up of. <clears throat> so let's start off with the builders of bone. So within um, the uh, periosteum and the endosteum, you have uh, what are called osteogenic cells. And uh, osteogenic cells are cells that can become the builders of new bone. So once osteogenic cells make a transition into builders, they have become what we call osteoblasts. So your osteoblasts are going to be the builders of new bone. And they go through a process of what's called bone deposition. They deposit uh, new bone on top of uh, actually a cartilage model of bone. So uh, for example, when we're talking about cartilage uh, being ossified or turned into new bone, that, that's the process of deposition that osteoblasts go through. And that epiphyseal line or the growth plate that you see in a long bone is made up of that cartilage and it's going to contain osteoblasts that are laying down um, new ground substance and fibers to build new bone. So those osteoblasts are the bone builders. So you can remember blast B for build. And once an osteoblast has secreted new bone around it, the osteoblast is, uh, because bone is, is hard, is going to eventually become trapped inside a lacuna. So that's this little hole where an osteoblast is going to have to reside after it secretes new bone around itself. So they, they eventually trap themselves in bone. And once they've done that, they're going to transition into a cell type called osteocytes. So an osteocyte is going to be the mature um, or kind of the final form of um, the osteogenic to osteoblast to osteocyte progression. So uh, these mature osteocytes trapped in their lacuna, their job is no longer going to be to build new bone, but it's going to be to maintain bone. So uh, bone requires some maintenance and osteocytes are able to uh, make it so that that bone is going to last. So on the other uh, side of the coin are the breakers or, or the cells that are responsible for breaking down bone. And uh, you might ask why that would be necessary. So I mentioned before that bones are a reservoir. Uh, they, they're a storage site for calcium and other minerals. And uh, other organs and tissues in your body need those minerals. So in the case where um, there's a negative feedback loop that requires release of stored calcium, for example, you have to break down some bone to release that calcium. So the cells that do this are the osteoclasts, and they basically are the opposite of your osteoblasts. Instead of laying down or depositing new bone, they are going to break down preformed bone and release those, those minerals. So the process of breaking down bone by osteoclasts is called bone resorption. And um, it's a, a very significant process in terms of maintaining homeostasis of things like calcium and phosphate. Now I'd like to talk about exactly how it is that bones grow as we age. And uh, I'm, I'm talking uh, specifically about in long bones where you have those structures, the epiphyseal plates, also known as the growth plates. So in uh, someone who has not yet reached adulthood, so in adolescence, um, these epiphyseal plates um, are going to be uh, made up of cartilage. 
So uh, in, in that cartilage-based tissue, you're going to find what are called chondrocytes. Those are the cells that are uh, responsible for making up cartilage, living in cartilage. And uh, as I mentioned previously, um, new bone is going to be built on a scaffold of cartilage. So you need these cartilage producing cells in order to have new bone growth. So how a long bone grows in length specifically is at these epiphyseal plates, which are again made of cartilage before a person has reached uh, mature, maturity or adulthood. So um, within that epiphyseal plate, if we zoom in a little bit, there are a few different zones that are important uh, and have different um, cells at different stages of bone growth. So um, I'll start off by saying that bone is going to be added toward uh, the diaphysis. So um, new bone growth is going to occur in this direction and that's going to stretch the bone out as that growth continues. So that's going to allow it to grow in length. So the first of these uh, levels is called the zone of proliferation. And what proliferation is, is just a, a fancy term for cell division. These cells are actively dividing and becoming uh, more numerous. And as these chondrocytes in the zone of proliferation divide, um, layers of cells are going to be added and they're going to move up in the epiphyseal plate. So cells as they are produced are going to move up through these different cycles. So proliferating cells, new layers are being added, new cells um, are uh, going through mitosis, producing new cells. After new cells have been produced, um, they will enter the zone of what's called hypertrophy and maturation. So you know what it means um, to be mature. These cells are going to, um, you know, become what their destined, what their ultimate destiny is to be. Um, so you have maturation, and, and part of maturation of cells is just like maturation of human beings, so that we get larger as we grow and mature. So um, this term hypertrophy just means to become larger. So as these cells mature after, they're, uh, after they've been produced through this zone of proliferation, as they mature, they get larger, go through hypertrophy. Um, as those larger cells um, begin to move on up to the next layer, uh, those larger, more mature cells are going to begin to calcify. Now, um, as you move further and further up this direction, as these cells progress through these zones, they get further and further from the blood supply that's providing nutrients and oxygen. So the further you get from the zone of proliferation, the, the less nutrients you're getting. And eventually you get to this zone of calcification. And, and that's where your chondrocytes are going to begin to die. So they have secreted um, the, the ground substance and fibers of this cartilage around them and become trapped in lacuna of their own. And they're far from the blood supply, so they begin to die. Uh, chondrocytes in the zone of calcification are dying. And as they die, um, calcium salts are going to be uh, kind of added to this zone and you get calcification. The, the, this zone is where hardness of bone um, joins in with the collagen fibers that are already present from these chondrocytes. So this is where you start to see something resembling new bone and that comes along with uh, the death of those chondrocytes. Um, the next zone is the zone of ossification. And uh, so this is where you're going to get actual um, new bone formation, what we would call the new bone. So how that occurs is you already know that osteoblasts are the cell type that is responsible for making new bone. So um, 
osteoblasts, it's not the chondrocytes that are actually making the bone. It's osteoblasts. And so osteoblasts invade this zone of ossification. And they are going to be um, ultimately responsible for uh, creating the, the bone that you see on top of this zone of ossification. So um, this calcified cartilage that you have here um, that comes from calcification after the death of the chondrocytes, that's not actually new bone. But what it is is a model um, where osteoblasts can lay down new bone on top of that. So that calcified cartilage in the zone of ossification is going to be removed and osteoblasts invade and lay down new bone here. And new bone, of course, is going to be added in this direction. So um, as new bone is added here, that is going to stretch the bone out longer and longer and allow the bone to expand in length. As long as um, the, the hormones um, are still telling bone to grow. And of course, your hormones die down after adolescence. As, as a mature adult, these bones are going to um, slow and eventually stop growing in length. And this cartilage in the epiphyseal line is also going to be replaced ultimately with bone. It's going to become ossified and then it will be called the epiphyseal line instead of the epiphyseal plate. The other manner in which bones are going to grow is called appositional growth and that simply means growth in width. So during the process of appositional growth um, you have osteoblasts living in the periosteum so that outer layer around a long bone, the periosteum, contains osteoblasts. And of course, uh, the osteoblasts, as we mentioned previously, are the builders. So they are going to be adding new circumferential lamellae. So new layers of bone on the outside of the bone, where that periosteum is. And that's going to cause the bone to grow in width. Um, and this is primarily uh, going to be in the diaphysis. Um, so as those osteoblasts are adding new layers around the outside where that periosteum is, allowing that bone to grow in width, you also have, um, in, in addition to deposition of new bone, you're going to have resorption of bone. But this is not taking place where the new bone is being added is taking place inside the medullary cavity. So inside that medullary cavity, um, at the same time that new lamellae are being added to the outside of the bone, you have the activity of osteoclasts increasing the size of that medullary cavity. So as new bone is being added to the outside, making it wider, the medullary cavity itself is also increasing in diameter due to the activity of osteoclasts. So they are chewing away at the inside of the bone at the same time that new layers of bone are being added to the outside. And this uh, balance of osteoblasts and osteoclast activity allows the bone to grow proportionally. So the bone itself grows larger as does the medullary cavity. It's not one or the other. Um, and again, this, this process is going to be um, according to the presence of hormones. I'd like to now uh, talk a little bit more deeply about the hormonal effects on bone growth. Uh, and so, of course, uh, you, you think about an adolescent uh, who's doing a lot of growing as having uh, wildly dynamic levels of hormones or high levels of certain hormones can be uh, often associated with behavioral changes but also uh, specific physical changes um, that are occurring rapidly in, in uh, young adolescents who are uh, experiencing the production of sex hormones. But first um, let's talk about the growth hormone and what its effects are. Uh, so human growth hormone is going to have uh, effects on both increases in length 
and in width of the bone, as are the rest of these hormones to varying degrees. So how growth hormone exerts its effect on bone growth is by stimulating mitosis in chondrocytes. So in that epiphyseal plate where you have uh, that zone of proliferation, those chondrocytes are going to go through mitosis uh, or are going to divide faster and faster the more growth hormone you have present. So that just increases the rate of uh, the, the growth in terms of length of, of a long bone. Um, you're also going to stimulate your osteogenic cells. So those osteogenic cells will eventually become osteoblasts that are responsible for laying down new bone in the uh, zone of ossification. Um, and they're also, uh, those osteoblasts are going to be um, responsible for growth in terms of width, that appositional growth. So growth hormone affects um, both growth in length and growth in width, as do the sex hormones, testosterone and estrogen. So testosterone is, is going to um, do the same thing. It's going to contribute to growth in length and in width, um, but eventually the amounts of testosterone. Testosterone is also going to stimulate the closure of the epiphyseal plate. So um, it's, it's a little counterintuitive, but uh, in, in bursts, testosterone can lead to increases, uh, and, and certainly does lead to increases in the, in the growth of bone. But um, as it peaks, it's actually going to cause the closure of that epiphyseal plate. And, and eventually, testosterone causes that bone to stop growing completely. Now, estrogen is going to have the same effect. However, um, it's going to, unlike how I had drawn that just now, estrogen is going to lead to rapid closure um, of that epiphyseal plate. So, uh, in terms of growth and, and their effects on growth, um, testosterone is, is, as a sex hormone, going to lead to more bone growth than estrogen is because the closure of the epiphyseal plate is slower in response to testosterone than it is with estrogen. So uh, a female um, is going to have a ra more rapid closure of that epiphyseal plate. And that's why you see a height difference on average between um, males and females is because of the effects of estrogen versus testosterone on closing or halting new bone growth at the epiphyseal plate. So I've stated before that bone is a dynamic organ, meaning um, it's got the capacity to be altered, uh, either broken down or built back up. And <clears throat> we're going to focus first on um, the, the remodeling process. We, we call it uh, bone remodeling whenever um, bone that already exists is changed, either adding new bone through the process of deposition or through resorption, uh, removing bone. So first, just talking about um, new bone formation, deposition of new bone, and what causes it. Well, ultimately, the two causes of bone deposition are increased osteoblast activity. So the, those cells that are responsible for depositing bone, um, if they increase their activity relative to the activity of osteoclasts, um, you're going to see an increase in bone deposition. And the other way that you can get an increase uh, overall, a net increase in bone deposition, is by inhibiting the activity of osteoclasts. So either of these changes, either stimulating osteoblasts or inhibiting osteoclasts, is going to have the same net result, which is that de deposition of new bone is going to predominate. Um, so there's always a balance of activity between osteoblasts and osteoclasts, but shifts in the balance are what ultimately causes either 
deposition of bone or resorption of bone. So what are the, um, the, the reasons for increases in osteoblast activity? Well, uh, osteoblasts will increase their activity in response to a few different, um, uh, a, a few different reasons. Uh, the first of these is increased tension on bones. And this is related to uh, your behavior. So the, the more exercise uh, you perform, the more weight you put on, uh, the more stress you put on your bones, I should say, um, there's a proportional increase in osteoblast activity. And that's to compensate for that extra stress on those bones. So um, someone who uh, works out with a lot of weights, they're putting extra stress on their bones and there's an increase in osteoblast activity to, co to compensate for that. Um, osteoblasts are also responsive, uh, responsive to the hormone testosterone. So um, when you get an increase in bone length, uh, due to the sex hormone testosterone. Um, that's primarily because testosterone increases the activity of osteoblasts. Osteoblasts are also going to be affected uh, by the presence of vitamins and minerals. So the vitamins first. Um, vitamin C is a vitamin that your body uses to um, in, in the process of creating collagen. So that's uh, of course, the, the fibers that make up the tensile strength of bone, and those are required to build new bone. So vitamin C is going to stimulate the activity of osteoblasts. Um, vitamin D is related to our stomach's ability, or our intestines, I should say, uh, ability to absorb calcium. And calcium is another requirement um, for osteoblasts to be at peak activity. So if you have enough calcium, you have enough vitamin D, um, and you're absorbing enough calcium because you have that vitamin D, um, that's also going to increase the overall uh, osteoblast activity. And there's also um, some evidence to suggest that vitamin K is also uh, involved in osteoblast activity, can stimulate osteoblasts. Um, and, and lastly, again, I just want to hammer home the point that um, both calcium and collagen are, are necessary for new bone formation. And so calcium and vitamin C, uh, of course, are going to be uh, required for osteoblast activity. So in addition to increasing the activity of osteoblasts, you can also shift toward depositing new bones by decreasing the activity of osteoclasts, those cells that break down bone. And estrogen works um, kind of in a roundabout way to accomplish the same goal as testosterone. But instead of stimulating osteoblasts, the job of estrogen is to inhibit osteoclasts. But the net result is the same. Um, calcitonin is a hormone that's produced by the thyroid gland. And uh, we'll look at this in further in greater detail in just a minute. But um, calcitonin is going to oppose another hormone called parathyroid hormone. And it's related to um, maintenance of calcium ion homeostasis. So uh, how we regulate how much calcium is in our blood is through the action um, of the thyroid and parathyroid glands releasing calcitonin or parathyroid hormone. But so calcitonin is going to uh, decrease the activity of osteoclasts and is going to favor bone deposition. And the reason that calcitonin um, is going to be involved in calcium homeostasis is that when we have an excess of calcium or we have more than we need, um, calcium is going to be stored. Remember we said that bones are a calcium reservoir. Um, so you have an excess of calcium. The thyroid hormone is going to uh, deal with that excess by releasing calcitonin, which decreases osteoclast activity, and that excess calcium can be stored in the form of new bone. Um, so in this way, increased blood calcium levels uh, which are going to lead to the release of calcitonin 
are, are going to ultimately inhibit the activity of osteoclasts and result in deposition of new bone. So this process of resorption is uh, just the opposite of bone deposition. Instead of depositing bone, we're removing it. And um, it makes sense that uh, the, the roles of osteoblasts and osteoclasts in this process have now been reversed. So inhibiting osteoblasts is going to shift um, the, the balance of these two in favor of resorption as well as stimulating osteoclasts. Either of those two can um, lead to bone loss through resorption. So um, I mentioned that behaviorally, if, if you're exercising uh, using large weights, um, putting tension on your bones for you know, brief periods of time, um, that's going to cause bone buildup or uh, deposition. Whereas someone who's sedentary or is getting a lack of good exercise is going to um, inhibit the uh, ability of osteoblasts to lay down new bone. So their activity is going to be inhibited with decrease in exercise. Um, as well as the lack of those vitamins and minerals that we mentioned were essential for putting down new bone. If you lack those, that's going to also um, inhibit the activity of osteoblasts, leading to an increase in bone breakdown or resorption. And stimulating uh, osteoclasts can also be done um, by continuous pressure. So um, we mentioned that tension on bones is, uh, is going to cause a proportional response of laying down new bone to resist that, uh, that increase in tension, to help you compensate for tension. But if that pressure is continuous for a long enough period of time, that can actually stimulate osteoclasts to break down bone. So uh, some of these changes are, are actually seen uh, when you apply braces. If, if you have braces to fix the, um, uh, the, the angle of your teeth, um, bone can actually be resorbed to help the, the, those teeth move um, by placing continuous pressure on those bones. So continuous pressure uh, is actually going to lead to an increase in osteoclast activity. Uh, calcitonin um, was the hormone that's released by the thyroid gland in response to a, an excess of calcium. So what happens if you have low blood calcium is a negative feedback loop where instead of um, depositing that excess, we're now going to have to remove calcium from bone and put it back into the blood to, to compensate for low blood calcium. So parathyroid hormone is going to be uh, the hormone that opposes calcitonin. If you have too little calcium, your parathyroid gland is going to release PTH and that's going to stimulate your osteoclast, um, which will then bring that blood calcium level back into an acceptable range. So this uh, just summarizes uh, the different factors that lead to either um, bone deposition or bone resorption. And I want to add that um, ultimately, again, whether bone is being laid down or whether it's being resorbed is uh, completely due to the balance of osteoblast versus osteoclast activity. So to finish up our lecture on bone, I would like to talk about what happens when you break a bone. Of course there's repair taking place, but what are the processes that allow bone to heal? So let's imagine we have a long bone here that is fractured. When you're fracturing that bone, you're also fracturing the blood vessels that supply it, or I shouldn't say fracture, but you're doing damage to them. And when you damage a blood vessel, that's going to lead to the formation of a blood clot. In this case, we're going to call that a hematoma. And uh, in, in doing damage to those blood vessels and forming the hematoma, um, the hematoma is kind of a thick, uh, you know, a blood clot is a thick jelly-like uh, substance, and you're going to actually cut off the blood supply to um, the, the tissue of the bone surrounding it, uh, the break. So 
you're going to have death of some bone cells, uh, but you're going to stop the bleeding with that hematoma. Now, after um, the, the formation of that hematoma, you're going to move into uh, the second phase of bone repair, which is the formation of what's called a soft callus. So that hematoma is going to be invaded by cells that are found in the periosteum. So um, osteogenic cells that, that can become cells related to uh, bone formation are going to um, invade the area where the hematoma is, and those are going to uh, become chondrocytes. They're also going to have invasion of fibroblasts. Um, so the, the function of the fibroblasts is to secrete collagen fibers. Um, dense irregular connective tissue is what's going to be uh, is going to make up part of this soft callus. So fibroblasts secrete those um, collagen fibers and that forms kind of a, a connective tissue that fills in the gap where that hematoma is. And those chondrocytes are going to start to lay down cartilage, uh, a model that can then be used um, to be invaded by your osteoblasts. So this soft callus is eventually going to be replaced by uh, the formation of a bone callus. So the soft callus becomes a bone callus. Osteoblasts are going to invade that soft callus and start to deposit bone. And so uh, what you eventually end up with is this bony callus that doesn't have the same shape as the original bone. There's going to be some extra bone tissue. And in the fourth step of bone repair, you have osteoclasts that are going to resorb that extra bone tissue. They're going to remove the outer portions of that bony callus and leave you with a healed bone that is uh, more or less structurally stable and has the same shape as the original bone. So uh, this process of bone repair kind of has these four main steps, the hematoma, the soft callus, the bony callus, and then um, resorption to uh, the, more or less the original form of the bone. So um, that'll do it for uh, our lecture on bone, and this will be uh, the end of the material that will be covered on lecture three, uh, excuse me, exam three. Um, so until next time, Dr. Noto out.